I'm informed the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 28 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator McKim proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 11 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. There is a housing crisis in Australia, and the Morrison government is refusing to Senator, fix it. Senator Faruqi, sorry, would you be able to uh, move the motion at the start yes. of your contribution, please? Um, I move the MPU. The there is a housing motion. crisis in Australia, and the Morrison government is refusing to fix it. In fact, there is a very, very deliberate strategy by the coalition to appear to be doing something about the housing crisis while ignoring the very policy settings that have brought us to this point. Yes, in the middle of the pandemic, the government announced grants and schemes that would even further exacerbate the housing crisis. Instead of making real change, you lot keep coming up with harebrained schemes like the granite benchtop renovation grants. Mm -hmm. The grants were for home renovations that could cost between $150,000 to $750,000. What a joke! All this while, there are people living without heating in public housing around the country, and those who have been waiting for months to get urgent repairs to their homes. Thank you. Is this housing crisis a joke to you all? What an affront to the people who are doing it tough, to people who can't make the rent, or who can't save up a deposit, and those who are sleeping rough. But you don't really care about them. All you care about is the billionaires and the corporations, your mates. The so-called family home guarantee that you have, you have established is just a government debt trap and a loan guarantee for the big banks. It seems the minister wakes up in the morning, possibly after whining and dining with the slick lobbyists from the big lenders, and comes up with these rubbish schemes that benefit no one at the very top end of town. Housing policy in this country has been some of the most craven collapses to your mates. Much has been written about the mess that is housing. One recent article asked, there is a housing crisis in Australia, so how is the coalition going to fix it? Well, the answer is they're not. They're not going to fix it. They're not interested in fixing it. The coalition are too close to their donors, their mates in the big banks, the big developers and investors, those who made out like bandits during the pandemic. COVID-19 has not stopped the homelessness or housing affordability crises. As we emerge from the pandemic, we should be doing everything we can to make sure that everyone has a roof over their head. Unfair tax rules like negative gearing and the capital gains tax discount make it easier for someone to buy their fifth investment property than a first home to live in. These have to be dismantled so people looking for their first home can actually afford it. There has been radio silence on negative gearing and capital gains tax discount from the Liberals, and the Labour have completely backflipped on it. These concessions to the wealthy are the reason we are in this housing crisis. The Greens want to wind back negative gearing and the capital gains tax discount so we can put downward pressure on house prices. The average property price in Sydney has now hit $1.3 million. People who have been able to enter the housing market are staring down the barrel at a massive mortgage, which they'll be paying off for decades, while most can't even think of buying a property in Sydney. In parts of regional New South Wales, the vacancy rate has fallen below 1%. Crisis accommodation is at capacity, and rental vacancies are virtually non-existent. There are reports of families living in tents and vans while sending their kids off to stay with relatives. The rates of homelessness have pushed domestic violence and homelessness groups to say in New South Wales that we are on the brink of a humanitarian crisis. 
We have such a severe shortage of social housing in this country that over 100,000 people are counted as sleeping rough in the last census. These people are invisible to the privileged members of the LNP. These people, time and time again, are completely left behind by this government who decides to pass the buck on social housing to states and territories. We need massive investment from the federal government to build a million new sustainable public and community homes so people can have a secure and permanent place to call a home. Everyone has a right to a safe and secure home. The government is responsible for making sure that this happens. So do your bloody job. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, it's a great pleasure to rise and uh, discuss homelessness and housing affordability uh, because uh, my party, the Liberal Party, has for more than 75 years been the champion of home ownership. And you only have to go back to our party's founder, Robert Menzies, um, who was uh, in the lead up to the creation of the Liberal Party in the early 1940s, uh, talking vigorously about the value of home ownership. Because, of course, there's a value of home ownership which transcends money, uh, because people who have a home have a greater stake in society. And I think that's something that we can all uh, agree on. Now, at the end of the Menzies era, home ownership sat at about 70 per cent, which is, which is a high number uh, when you consider home ownership figures around the world. And so it's always been part of the, the fabric of the Liberal Party's DNA that we support home ownership. Of course we do. Uh, and that is something that we have been pursuing in more recent years, including during the Morrison government's tenure, where we have established NIFIC, uh, which is the organisation designed to drive housing, drive housing in terms of social housing and also community housing, because we are, we are concerned uh, that there have been instances where essential, I mean, everyone, I mean, I should say at this juncture that I mean, everyone's got an important job. I mean, an essential worker is every worker. Uh, but there have been instances where people that are working in the services, whether they are working um, as police or AMBOs, uh, have not been able to access the housing market uh, in inner city Melbourne and Sydney. And one of the things that NIFIC has been doing has been to establish uh, community housing. Uh, and now I've had the pleasure of meeting with some of these organisations uh, throughout Sydney, where NIFIC has invested uh, public money to ensure that uh, people who are working in the, in the services are able to access uh, houses in the inner city. Now, NIFIC, over the few years it's already been in, in operation, uh, has delivered $2.5 billion in approved loans, uh, which has resulted in 4,600 new dwellings and 8,300 existing dwellings. Uh, so that is a tangible example of a program established under the Morrison government which has been driving higher levels of social and community housing, thereby building on that Manzian legacy of our overriding uh, generational commitment to home ownership. Because uh, without home ownership, people do have a lower level of buy-in to our society. Now, one of the, the interesting parts of this debate here is the Labor Party is obsessed with superannuation for various political and economic reasons. Um, I mean, it's great to come in here and be lectured uh, by the Greens about, about how, how apparently we are corrupt, but I mean, the most, corrupt, the most corrupting element that has been a feature of Australian economic policy over the last 30 years has been superannuation, because the superannuation funds and the unions have bought the Labor Party's policy advocacy lock, stock and barrel. Now, um, it is true that home ownership has reduced significantly over the last 30 years. And what, else, what also happened 30 years ago? The superannuation scheme started. Now, there is no doubt that when you look at low-income workers, people have to choose between their super guarantee and a deposit for a first home. I've had people write to me saying that um, basically because of their super contribution, they won't be able to pull together a, a home ownership deposit, a first home deposit. 
Now that is a that is a depressing consequence of super. Um, and, and not everything needs to be, be boiled down into, into talking points written by a central office. Um, uh, the reality is super is actually quite a good idea. There is no question that self-provision is a good idea, especially as we face uh, un, unpleasant, I should say, or uh, perhaps uh, um, undesirable demography. Now, next week we'll see the intergenerational report, and that will give us a snapshot of Australia's future when that is released on Monday. Uh, and th that will again highlight the need for Australia to save more. And so uh, those of us on our side of the House are not hostile to super, uh, but we would like to see it work better. The laws passed last week will finally put in place a system which will ensure that super is going to work for the workers as opposed to working for the unions and the banks. But um, there is more that super could do to drive home ownership. And throughout the course of this period in office, the Liberal Party has deployed uh, some changes to the super scheme, which will allow super to be used for a first home. So in the last budget, we have expa expanded the, the first home super saver scheme uh, so that people um, can pull out up to $50,000 out of their super to use for a first home. Now, that is, that is an entirely reasonable proposition. Um, but that, I mean, that, that is a proposition which is available to people that are putting in discretionary contributions above and beyond their super guarantee. Now, most Australians don't have the means to do that. So I still think that there is, there is merit in the long, longer term of us looking at circumstances in which people could use their super guarantee contributions uh, to purchase a first home. Uh, I think it is mean uh, to uh, deny people access to their own money for the purposes of home ownership. And that is something I hope we return to in the future. Now, of course, the super funds have their own plan here. Now, the super funds have been lobbying down here in Canberra and they want to get special tax treatment so they can um, you know, acquire or uh, get access to what they call build to rent uh, dwellings, where effectively they would uh, own the buildings and then they would rent the buildings out to the super fund members. So thereby the, the funds own the building, the members uh, pay the funds to rent their flats or their apartments or their houses from the super funds. So that, that then embeds a loss of home ownership for all time because, of course, the super funds own it. But they are motivated by, by profit, not by uh, any sort of altruistic uh, purpose. And so uh, in order to, to drive more home ownership, uh, we have as well introduced measures to allow people to downsize and so people can um, sell their family home, if you like, and then put that money into super. Uh, equally, uh, we have increased the CGT discount. Now, on the question of taxes, I mean, I've never seen a higher tax burden create more homes. Now, at the last election, Labor had a policy which would have, which would have, uh, which would have reduced the CGT discount um, and thereby increase the tax burden on, on houses. Now, um, as we pointed out during the election campaign, increasing uh, housing taxes will mean you'll have fewer houses. Uh, and so Labor appears now have run away, to run away from that, that policy. Now, let's see what they do in the upcoming election. My sense is that they will adopt a small target strategy, uh, and that may be politically advantageous, but uh, as we know with Labor, there's always a hidden high tax somewhere. And so ultimately, the, the, the choice here is, is pretty simple. I mean, we, we will always pursue targeted policies to try and drive home ownership because that is what we've done since the Menzies era. Now, over, over the last, last year, um, as a result of our policies through NIFIC uh, in particular, uh, you've now seen the highest level of home ownership for first home buyers since 2009. So more than 155,000 people who are first home buyers. Um, have entered the market in the year to March 2021, according to the ABS. So our policies are driving a high level of home ownership, and it is a social, moral and economic uh, good for us to be driving home ownership. As I say, at the end of the Menzies era, you had 70 per cent of people uh, in, in homes. I mean, that, that is, that is a, a high figure and a figure we should try and maintain over the long run, because people who have a home, people who live in a home, have a greater stake in society, and there is more value 
to a home than just the words that were uttered in, in the castle. Uh, I mean, a home is a, is a place to live, it is, is a place to build a family, and there will always be a great value in that, which is why we have pursued a multitude of measures. That's why we've established NIFIC. That's why we've, we've tried to drive community and social housing, because we want to see people who are coppers and ambos and nurses to get access to inner city housing, because that is, that is important. Uh, it, is, it is an important part of the social fabric. So home ownership is, on the, is heading in the right direction under, under us. Uh, Labor Party solutions is just to have more and more super for their mates, the unions. Um, unfortunately, the super guarantee increase will eat the wages increase uh, that is built into the budget over the forward estimates. Uh, but uh, Labor don't care about that because they'd just rather see all the money go to the super funds, ultimately through to the unions and then subsequently through to the Labor Party so they can use it uh, for campaigning purposes. So it is a regrettable situation, but uh, more homes under us. See you. Senator Polly. Well, thank you very much. I rise to, to make a contribution uh, in relation to this urgency motion. There is a housing crisis in Australia, and the Morrison government is refusing to fix it. Well, we just had that very clearly articulated by the good senator who's leaving the chamber now. He has no idea no understanding how difficult it is in the Australian community to be able to get into the housing market, to be able to afford to rent. But what we did see from his contribution or hear from his contribution was once again, it's all the fault of the Labor Party, all the fault of the unions and superannuation. Well, we should be encouraging people to uh, save for their uh, retirement. That's what superannuation is all about. But it's in their DNA. Got to blame the unions, got to knock superannuation. When in reality, in my home state of Tasmania, it is so critical that we put some attention to resolving the housing crisis. Because what we have seen in recent years is home ownership in Tasmania being out of the reach of ordinary Tasmanians. It is 40 per cent. 40 per cent increase in rent in my home city of Launceston in the last few years. That's a lot of money. Now, we know because we see firsthand the effects of what happens when people don't have a secure roof over their head and able to uh, house their families and the devastation that that causes uh, to families and individuals. But in the past year, the Tasmanian property prices outside of Hobart have risen a staggering 18 per cent. And I've been shocked at how quickly houses are being gobbled up and sold in Launceston and in Hobart, but there is a real struggle for people trying to get into the rental market. Now, we know that if a person is paying more than 30 per cent of their income into rent, that they are at a much higher risk of ending up being homeless. Now, I've seen it going out with support organisations who help feed and accommodate people who are doing it tough. It is extremely difficult. And we know that the growing cohort of homeless people are older women. Older women who haven't had the opportunity necessarily to put money away in their superannuation, their relationships break down, they find themselves without a family home. We know that the demographics are there every single day. If you just open your eyes when you're driving around the, seats, the, the cities uh, and the streets of where you live, the people that are now on the street, living in their cars, uh, couch surfing, moving from one friend or one family's accommodation to the other. Now, we can do something about this, and Labor has a plan to address the housing affordability in this country and to expand the access to social housing, because every Australian, every Australian deserves to have a roof over their heads. But do we have any of those issues addressed by the contributions that, thus far from the government? No, we haven't. But we will set up if elected, a Labor government will have a housing uh, future fund that will build 30,000 social houses in the first five years. But we shouldn't have to wait for an election because those on that side of the chamber could already take a leaf out of our book and actually address social housing in this country. Um, they could also uh, scrap 
the cap on the first home loan deposit scheme, which we have been repeatedly calling for the government to take action there. What we should be doing is taking whatever steps, working with the states, removing stamp duty so people can get into their first home. But these people on that side of the chamber have been in government for eight long years and under their watch is becoming increasingly more expensive and out of reach for people to be able to rent a home or to buy a home in this country. Well, we won't stop. Uh, raising these issues and speaking up for, for people that do find themselves on the streets and homeless. And let's be frank, anyone can find themselves in that circumstance. So we do need to also ensure that there is training provided to ensure that we have the capacity to build the homes of the future, that there's land released through the state governments to ensure that there is social housing and housing affordability becomes a real uh, achievable goal for all Australians. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Housing is a human right and it should not be treated like a commodity. Just like the rest of the nation, Queensland is in a housing and homelessness crisis. And over the last few months, I've met with organisations right around the state, like the North Queensland Domestic Violence Resource Service in Townsville, uh, the Women's Centre FNQ in Cairns, and the Cairns Homelessness Services Hub. Every single support service that I meet with tells me the same story. They're doing everything they can to help people in need, but there is no crisis housing. There is no transitional housing and there is no long-term public or private housing to send people to. These services are relying on minuscule budgets to put people up in hotel accommodations. Uh, budgets that are meant to last for a whole year are running out by the end of February. There are 47,000 people on the social housing waiting list in Queensland and almost 9,000 of them are children. The average wait time is two years, but many people wait far longer than that. And while they wait, they move from insecure accommodation to insecure accommodation, or they stay in abusive relationships because they've got nowhere else to go, or they sleep in cars, or they risk losing work and regular attendance at school or university because they cannot find a home. It's even harder for people with disability looking for homes that they can access safely, for First Nations people or for people from cold communities for whom navigating a complex social housing system is overwhelming, harder again. A woman in Yarrabah just rang my office about an hour ago saying that she's been on the social housing waiting list for 23 years. She now has three kids that need a roof over their heads too. I spoke to a woman on the Sunshine Coast who's living on the aged pension. She was facing eviction into homelessness after her rent was increased by $80 a week by a profiteering landlord looking to cash in on the influx of people moving up from Melbourne and Sydney to avoid uh, lockdowns. There are no other suitable affordable homes for her on the market, and her experience is similar to so many other older women, which is why older women are the fastest growing demographic of homeless folk in this nation. Another young woman was given crisis accommodation during the first COVID lockdown measures in April 2020, but once that was no longer available, she had to sleep in her car. Now, my office managed to advocate for her and help her find appropriate housing through a local provider, um, but those local providers are overstretched and under-resourced, and it shouldn't take individual lobbying for every Queenslander to find a safe, accessible and affordable home. Towns in Queensland are facing a chronic undersupply of public and private housing. This is a national crisis. But the Liberal, National and Labor parties continue to accept massive donations from the property development industry to the tune of almost 30 million since 2012. And so their policies benefit developers and investors and the banks, and those uh, stay in place. Under this government, it's cheaper to buy your fifth or sixth home than your first. It is a national disgrace. Everyone deserves a home. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. Um, uh, this is a, a, a crucial and uh, uh, important issue to every Australian. Uh, I agree with the previous speaker that every Australian deserves to uh, have, a, have a house and, and a home. Um, there are obviously people that are in very unfortunate circumstances from time to time, and it's not always possible for, for governments to solve every particular problem. But I don't think there's been a, uh, a federal government, a Commonwealth government, with more housing policies than this one. Uh, there is a raft of assistance being provided uh, to get people into a home. 
to allow them to own their own home, most importantly. Uh, uh, programs that we took to the last election and have a mandate to roll out, programs that we put in place during the coronavirus as a key way of, of, uh, of securing Australia's economic recovery, uh, and they've been very successful programs. Clearly, given the nature of this motion and the fact that it comes from uh, the non-government side of this chamber, the, 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 there, there are complaints there that these, these programs aren't doing what they want. Uh, I mean, I think there is a values difference here that needs to be espoused at first before we go further here. Uh, we, we, we unashamedly, on this side of the chamber, want to help people to own their own home. Because I, I listen to the individual examples given by Senator Waters, uh, which are touching and tragic for those involved. Ultimately, they come down to the fact that those individuals, for I'm sure a variety of reasons outside their control, did not own their own home, and they were then reliant on, on, on landlords, uh, on perhaps body corporates, uh, and that that is not a position you know I'd like to see. Uh, most Australians. I want to see Australians be able to afford their own home so they've got their own security uh, and take charge of their, their own lives, uh, not be beholden to a, to a corporation or, or, some, or some property developer. And, and yet most of the, um, the proposals I've heard will have listened to this debate from the other side would perpetuate such a dependence. They perpetuate a dependence uh, on a landlord or uh, on, on rental payments, rather than give people the security uh, and equity uh, to give them their own assets, their own home to look after, and one which they can't be uh, unfairly uh, kicked out of uh, at any minute. So that is why this government is focused on policies that can help achieve that goal, can achieve the goal of people owning their own home. And as I've said, we have a raft of these uh, policies. I, I, I don't know if a government has done more uh, in, in many recent times, at least perhaps since the immediate post-war period, where there was a real push by the Menzies government to get people into housing. And I want to pay credit to the <coughs> minister responsible here, Minister Michael Suker. I know how uh, focused he is uh, on giving people that dream of owning their own home, and he is very passionate about a variety of these programs. Uh, before the last election, before the last election, we announced uh, such a policy, the first home loan deposit scheme. I don't think the uh, opposition announced a housing policy, or certainly not a policy to help people own their own home. The opposition just ignored that. There were no mechanisms provided by the opposition to help people own their own home, but. But Scott Morrison and, and Michael Suker announced a great policy before the last election uh, to help people get, get their deposits together uh, to buy their own home. And what this program does is to help support 30,000 first home buyers uh, to enter uh, the market sooner, and, and it also uh, helped an additional, will help an additional 20,000 people from the 1st of July next year. It also offers a pathway to ownership for single parents, uh, obviously uh, people that, that would find it very difficult to save a, a deposit uh, for their own home, but 10,000 single parents will be able to access a government guarantee, a family home guarantee, that will help them unlock a loan uh, and a deposit or a no deposit loan uh, to help them buy uh, their own home. The scheme has been very successful. As I said, it was opened up for 30,000 places and already by January 2020, 19,000 first home buyers uh, have access to the scheme to enter and buy their first home sooner. Uh, another thousand are, are at the pre-approval stage or at that time at the pre-approval stage to do so. Um, as part of the budget, we're also expanding this scheme uh, to establish that 10,000 um, places for single parents. That will mean they'll only need a deposit of 2 per cent. 2 per cent. Um, I know when my wife and I were struggling to save up for our deposit, I think we got to about 10 per cent. It was tough. It was tough, but we had two people to do it. Obviously, if you're a single parent, it's very, very difficult. Uh, and, but 2 per cent is, is, is a very, very reasonable approach, and the government guarantee will help unlock that private sector finance 
for these people to own their own home, then they won't be subject to the vagaries of a, um, of a, of a landlord or of uh, just simply the, the housing market. Um, there is also, uh, also the home builder scheme, which has been massively successful as well. Pretty hard to get a tradie right now, partly because of the work that's been unlocked through the, the home builder scheme. That has provided uh, funding for people to build uh, their own home. Uh, um, it was, of course, a key measure of seeking to keep Australians in work uh, during the coronavirus, and it has been incredibly, incredibly uh, successful. It's made sure that our construction industry has continued to go very strongly uh, through a global pandemic, and it is building the housing stock, which will, which will uh, uh, make for more housing supply and ease some pressures. Now, um, given that, um, given the, given that, I do want to recognise some of the points we made here. Given how successful our economy has been in the last year, given how many expats are coming home to Australia because this is perhaps the best place in the world to be right now. It normally is, but it very much is the best place to be right now. We've got a lot of people coming home, and that is putting a lot of pressure on our housing market. It is seeing massive and record price increases, especially in our capital cities, but also, also in regional areas like where I am. Vacancy rates in regional Queensland are very low, uh, in most towns under 1 per cent, so it is very difficult for those that do not have secure housing, and I do recognise that. Uh, of course, the, the provision of social housing to those who, who can't uh, afford their own home is principally a responsibility of the state governments, um, and, but the federal government does support their initiatives. We do provide $1.6 billion each year under the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement to improve housing and homeless outcomes and improve social uh, uh, housing. We also provide $5.5 billion a year through Commonwealth rent assistance uh, to those who must be uh, in the rental market. We have expanded these measures as well with $23 million for new and expanded emergency accommodation for women and children escaping family and domestic violence under the Safe Places initiative. Uh, we've also invested $19 million to deliver more than 100 social or affordable homes as part of the Hobart uh, City deal. Uh, we are working in unison with other governments to work to do what we can um, to support the uh, increase in prices and lower availability of supply that we've seen. But ultimately, uh, uh, providing more housing supply, providing more housing options to people, is going to take us to build more houses. That's what we need to do. And I do worry it's a good thing that we've got this economic activity and that we're victims of our own success a bit with uh, successful and burgeoning property markets. But I do worry what we need to see is that supply response. We need to see uh, developments occur. We need to see new housing be built. But the red tape that now exists, especially at a local planning level, is so high that it makes it very hard for these kind of supply responses to occur. So we do have right now thousands of Australians finally wanting to move to regional Queensland. We've been desperately trying to uh, market and sell the benefits of living in country areas for decades, and finally we're seeing people want to do that. Uh, but, but there's not the housing available. Uh, there's plenty of land, plenty of land. There's good infrastructure. Probably need a little bit of upgrades, but, uh, but not, massive, not massive tunnels or anything you get in the cities. We can withstand more people in Rockhampton. We can take more people in Townsville. We can take more people in Emerald. But we need to get the housing supplies approved, the housing developments approved, or else they won't come. People will not come to live on the side of a street. And if people move out to the, to the regional areas and to a new home, that'll free up housing in the cities that we already have as well. And that will help all of us to do that. So I hope not only do we have specific programs to help bring more housing into this country, we also tackle the red tape that stops more homes being built and therefore more people having a roof over their head. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Uh, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. That was um, a very interesting contribution by the former Speaker because what he has failed to acknowledge in, in that contribution after eight long years of the Liberals being in government is that housing affordability right across the country has gotten worse and worse. There are more homeless Australians than ever before. It's harder to rent than ever before, and it's harder to buy a home than ever before. 
this crisis is hitting Australians from so many different walks of life. In the last year, Tasmanian property prices outside Hobart have risen by a staggering 18 per cent. At the same time, across Australia, 10,000 mums and kids trying to escape domestic violence were turned away, turned away from refuge because there wasn't a bed. Well, there is a pathway forward to, be to begin tackling Australia's housing crisis, despite the Morrison government steadfastly refusing to do anything of substance to fix this increasingly dire and desperate situation. And that's through an Albanese Labor government, because the Labor government would make real strides towards tackling our nation's housing crisis. An Albanese Labor government will create jobs, build homes and change lives through initiatives including our proposed $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund. Over the first five years, Labor's fund will build 20,000 new social housing properties, including 4,000 homes for women and children fleeing domestic violence and older women on low incomes who are at risk of homelessness and build 10,000 affordable homes for frontline workers like police, nurses and cleaners. Directly support 21,500 full-time jobs across the construction industry and the broader economy per year over five years nationwide. Importantly, one in 10 direct workers on site will be apprentices. Provide $200 million for the repair, maintenance and improvements of housing in remote Indigenous communities where some of the worst housing standards in the world are endured by our First Nations people. Invest $100 million in crisis and transitional housing for women and children fleeing domestic and family violence. Invest $30 million to build housing and fund specialist services for veterans who experience homelessness or at risk of homelessness. And this commitment from Labor has been very well received. In fact, Labor's policy has received a seemingly endless series of accolades from right across the housing sector. This includes ACOS, the Community Housing Industry Association, the Urban Development Institute of Australia, Homelessness Australia, Everybody's Home, the Property Council, National Shelter, St Vincent de Paul, the Master, Bu Master Builders, Power Housing Australia, Mission Australia and the Real Estate Institute. Let me quote you just a couple of the responses and reactions to Labor's Housing, Housing Australia Future Fund commitment. Mr Jack de Groot, the CEO of St Vincent de Paul in New South Wales, said, and I quote, it will work. We really welcome this announcement of Housing Australia Future Fund. We have a crisis and we need investment. I think this Future Fund is about a partnership between federal and state governments, as well as a community sector organisation, to actually build, build and then make sure this housing is available for those on low incomes. Michelle Adair, CEO of Housing Trust and Chair of the Community Housing Industry Association, said, the housing trust and the community housing sector, along with all our homelessness peak bodies, is applauding this announcement by Labor federally. So, that is just one of the things that Labor has put forward. But sadly, with this government, uh, they only work in the margins. We've seen that um, under their family home guarantee announcement that that has, has, not, that has been a complete flop until, uh, pressured by the community and Labor, they sought to change, uh, change the um, the level of price, the price cap on the family home guarantee. Now, that was exposed really from um, Launce the Launceston Examiner and a reporter there who had the um, gumption to actually expose the fact that there was only two houses in Launceston that would be able to be come under the fa the Liberals' family Senator, home guarantee. It's not good enough. You're Time has expired. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, Tasmania's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to start that again. Australia's housing market is totally and utterly cooked. Rather than a home being considered as a human right, something that everyone 
should have secure access to, housing has been turned through the deliberate choices of the neoliberal parties in this place into a game of speculation. And across the country, as a result, the cost of a home is more, much more than it should be. Houses are too expensive and rents, as a consequence, are far, far too high. And that's because over decades now the market has been rigged in favour of the speculators and the banks who profit from ever higher levels of household debt and ever higher rents. Now, none of this is an accident. From tax policy to tenancy laws, from banking regulation to decades of underinvestment in social housing, and of course, the Reserve Bank printing hundreds of billions of dollars of cash and pumping it into the banking system, which of course turns around and lends it out on mortgages driving house prices up. The system is designed to make homes more expensive, which is just the way the government likes it. Here's the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, from just last Friday. Overall, he said, it's a good thing for the economy when house prices go up as opposed to going down. Well, Mr Frydenberg, tell that to the over one third of Australians who do not own their own home and are forced to rent or to rely on relatives or friends or ultimately to become homeless. And it's worth noting that over the last 20 years, house prices have increased at nearly twice the rate that wages have in this country. So when the Treasurer says it's a good thing for house prices to go up, what he means it's a good thing for investors, but it's not a good thing for new homeowners who have to borrow more than ever or not get into the market, and it's a terrible thing for the one third of Australians who rent and have to use more and more of their income to pay their landlord's mortgage. But that's just the way the Liberals want it, because this government is all for property speculation, all for helping out their mates who benefit from it, be they developers, be they the banks or be they their rank and file who lord over massive property investment portfolios. It's not just the planet that is cooked, it is the housing market in this country that is cooked. Thanks, Senator Ayres. There is, um, <clears throat> you wouldn't uh, know this from Senator Canavan's remarks, but there is in fact a housing crisis uh, in regional Australia, in the towns, the country towns that the National Party bludges off uh, throughout regional Australia. There is a housing crisis of immense proportions. In the past year, rents in regional cities have been increasing at three times the rents in capital cities. Low income families previously moving to the regions to avoid high housing costs have been caught. In the Richmond Tweed region, rents have risen 17.6 per cent in the last year. In the Southern Highlands and Shoalhaven, rents have risen 13.2 per cent. On the mid north coast, rents up by 12.7 per cent. The Northern Star reported this week about what effect this is having on ordinary people in the Northern Rivers. A pregnant woman looking for a secure home before she gives birth. An older woman in a caravan because she can't find a rental. There are no properties available in that area available to single parents on JobSeeker. None. Meanwhile, there are record low vacancy rates across regional New South Wales. Families in the Riverina, South Coast and South East New South Wales struggling to find a place to live, living in caravans, under bridges, in parks, in tents, some of them in tents, living the, with their primary school aged children. The answer, of course, is simple. We need more housing stock and we need more public and social and affordable housing across regional New South Wales. And if you look at the areas that have the worst housing stress in the nation, if you look at the area where there is the biggest gap between the people who have got housing, uh, who have got property portfolios and the people who can't get housing, those areas have one thing in common. 
They are the areas that are represented in this place by the National Party. They are the areas where there is the strongest contest between the National Party, who, as I say, bludge off those areas, and off the Labor Party, who seek to represent those areas. Now, this government has managed to rack up a trillion dollars in debt, most of it before the COVID-19 crisis, and they've built nothing. Nothing in terms of infrastructure and certainly nothing in terms of social housing. Well, where is the National Party on these questions, the self-appointed party of regional Australia? What has been occupying their attention over the course of the last week? <coughs> well, of course, over the course of the last couple of years, the National Party has disappeared up its own fundament in an orgy of self-interest, recriminations, backbiting, uh, and, and indeed, Senator Brockman, I know you wouldn't behave like this. A, a passion for the self-interest, for their self-interest, for their own naked self-interest. Now, what were the things that brought them to this shameful position? Was it their failure to respond to the housing crisis in regional New South Wales? No, it never gets a mention. Was it their complete absence while the mouse plague is tearing apart? regional communities? No, nope, we haven't heard boo from them on that question. Was it the failed vaccine rollout in regional Australia? Nothing. I mean, some of them are vaccine deniers. Uh, nothing from them on that question. Is it the endemic labour market problems in regional Australia? The systematic underpayment of agricultural workers? The gutting of regional TAFEs? The decline of regional apprenticeships? The labour, hire, the labour hire rorts that rip money out of regional community, uh, communities and send it to big city shareholders. It was none of these things. Was it, was it the question of the future for agricultural exporters who are losing key markets to our European and United States competitors? No, nope, haven't heard boo about that either. Was it their failure to introduce a biosecurity levy? that would properly fund the biosecurity system that our farmers rely upon? Nope. Was it their failure to support drought-affected communities during the longest and deepest drought in recent history? I didn't hear much from them on that question either. Was it their failure to support bushfire-affected communities? No. Flood-affected communities? Zip. There is no shortage of reasons why the National Party, in a rare moment of introspection, might reach the conclusion that they are letting the people of regional Australia down. They are a junior party, a junior part of the coalition of this government, that are a doormat for Scott Morrison, with no plan for agriculture, no plan for the agriculture sector, no plans for jobs in country towns, and no plan to deal with the deep inequality that's reflected in the urgency resolution in front of the Senate that is making sure that working people in country towns have access to housing. Now, it used to be a basic right in a country town that no matter what your income, everybody had a home. And public housing in country towns was a great thing. It meant that low-income families could secure a home, but it also meant that moderate-income families, school teachers, could get access to easy housing, uh, easy access to housing, uh, and that there was some equality in country towns. Uh, but it's gone for most people. Housing is inaccessible, particularly for young people. So, what was the point of this squabble? this week? Was it a road to Damascus moment for the National Party, you know, the dregs of the squatocracy, what remains of the Australian bunyip aristocracy? No, it was about the only thing these characters have ever cared about—their own interests, their own jobs. Because, after all of this, has the new National Party leadership 
mention any of the serious issues facing rural and regional Australia? It wouldn't occur to them. It's definitely not front of mind. Their press conferences yesterday didn't talk about farmers or housing or wages or health care. It was only about themselves. They talked about the member for New England's personal sense of manifest destiny. He's burning overreaching desire for gratification and personal advancement. Has the phrase born to rule ever more appropriately described a man's approach to public life? Has anyone so perfectly balanced shamelessness with such an astonishing absence of a grasp of what his duty is to his electorate and to his constituents? This, this man, Mr Joyce, has now risen not once but twice to the position of Deputy Prime Minister. Now, the member for Riverina's leadership never amounted to much, but at least he looked like he cared about the people that he represented. He got a standing ovation from the House of Representatives yesterday. The member for New England's last departure from the office of Deputy Prime Minister uh, was much more ignominious. Now, Mr McCormack might not have done anything about the housing crisis in regional New South Wales, and I don't doubt that if he'd stayed he would have continued to do nothing about it. But at least he theoretically might have had the basic self-awareness to recognise it as a problem. Instead, what the people of Australia got yesterday was the co-host of the world's worst, most boring, self-aggrandising podcast, the old Weatherboard Nine. Uh, now, there's somebody in my office who is forced to listen to it from time to time, and I'm not sure whether Mr Joyce or Senator Kennevan, which one of them is Weatherboard and which one of them is Iron. No doubt this podcast won't be able to continue. It's not really befitting of the high office of Deputy Prime Minister to be running mad right-wing podcasts, but it will remain to be seen whether Weatherboard and Iron continues. It certainly, over its short life, has put the board in a weatherboard. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. A key part to addressing mental health is addressing the social determinants of mental ill health. And that starts and uh, continues to address the issue of housing and taking a housing approach, housing first approach to addressing mental health. Insecure housing and homelessness has an incredibly negative impact on people's mental health, stress and well-being, and it is basically impossible to access services and get long-term treatment if you are homeless or in secure housing. Suitable housing that is secure, affordable, of reasonable quality and of enduring, of enduring tenure is a particularly important factor in preventing mental ill health and a first step to promoting long-term recovery for people experiencing mental illness. 16 per cent of people with mental ill health live in unsuitable accommodation, meaning they are homeless, live in accommodation with overcrowding or at risk of eviction or their housing is of substandard quality. The Productivity Commission's report into mental health found that one quarter of all people admitted to acute mental health services are homeless prior to admission and most are discharged back into homelessness. Not only is an individual's recovery challenged by unstable accommodation, but follow-up care after discharge is more difficult, which in turn leads to the cycling of people back and through hospital emergency departments. To address this vicious cycle, of pro the Productivity Commission recommended as a priority reform that each government commit to, monitor and report on a national consistent policy of not discharging people with mental illness from hospitals, correctional facilities and institutional care into a situation of homelessness. But that means we actually need supply of affordable housing for people to go into. In my home state of WA, like the rest of Australia, we have a housing crisis. The rental vacancy, uh, the rental vacancy is at 1%, which is a 40-year low. 
In Perth, we have a medium rent of 460 bucks a week. How is that affordable? There is not even close to being affordable for anybody that is trying to survive, for example, on income support payments of $44 a day or on a low income. It is very clear that we need to address this housing crisis for everybody in Australia, for particularly those that are excluded from the housing market, but particularly this country says it's going to address mental ill health. Well, a key part of that is addressing the housing affordability crisis and make sure nobody with poor mental health has to live on the streets and are homeless. This is a travesty in this country as wealthy Senator as Australia. Seward, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Steele, John. Thank you. There is a significant lack of accessible housing in Australia. In the last 10 years, less than 5 per cent of housing, both public and private built, has been uh, built to an accessible uh, standard. And now, this is quite simply unacceptable. Disabled people have a right to live uh, in a safe place, uh, somewhere to call home, uh, just like everyone else. There is so little accessible housing in this country right now that there are hundreds of disabled people who are under the age of 65 uh, living in nursing homes, and one of the reasons for this uh, is the absence of accessible housing options. At the National Meeting of Building Ministers on 30 April this year, the states and territories agreed to include a minimum accessibility standard uh, for rental housing uh, and apartments in the National Construction Code of 2022, uh, based on the Liveable Housing Design Guidelines uh, Silver Standard. This national reform to the National Construction Code, uh, which will require all new homes to be built across Australia to a minimum access standard, was brought about by none other than ACT Greens Minister for Sustainable uh, Building and Construction, uh, Rebecca Vassarotti. This is a major breakthrough uh, for which the minister should be congratulated. Uh, but in Queensland, the Liberal National uh, Opposition Housing Minister wants to block uh, these important changes that will ensure that more disabled people have an accessible home uh, to live in. That's right, the Liberals right now in Queensland uh, want to make uh, it so that there is no need to implement these standards in that state, an absolutely uh, unacceptable position taken on behalf of their mates in the construction industry that don't want to do the work. Now, the standards set out in the construction guidelines should be the baseline. Not the, uh, not the ceiling, uh, but it is an excellent start for which the minister should be congratulated. Thank you, Senator Still, John. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, let's go back to the beginning of colonisation and understand or try for those that uh, refuse to accept the true history of this country, try to understand that first people of this country were thrown off their land, they were forced off their land, they were murdered and massacred for their land and pushed into what we now call homelessness. The squatters came in, they illegally occupied our lands and what did the squatters receive for illegally taking our homelands, they received wealth. They built their wealth from stolen land that saw the desecration of First Nations people 200 years ago. So that's where it began, with colonisation. Colonisation being the evil that still exists in this country that creates so much harm. Today we have a situation where Aboriginal people are living on the streets. They are disconnected from their country, their families and their communities. We have a party over here, the Labor Party, that is selling off public housing in Victoria quicker than a fire sale. We have a Liberal government over here that couldn't care less about the poor people of these, of, in these communities. 
that drive past in their million-dollar vehicles and, and see people sleeping on the street. This is a crisis, Senator and we need Thorpe, action. Your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. When I was a young adult, there were no people sleeping rough on the streets of our capital cities. My wife and I were able to buy a home in inner-city Melbourne on one and a half average incomes. It could be like this still. The huge change in the last 30 years is because of government policies, housing policies that favour the wealthy and leave the less well-off to struggle big time, that treat housing as a get-rich-quick scheme rather than a human right. Australia is in a housing crisis. We need to make housing more affordable, to build more houses, to provide more public and social housing. The Greens' policy is to build a million public, social and community homes. All of this is possible, but this government doesn't want to act. And I want to particularly highlight the situation facing the LGBTIQ community. Just today, the LGBTIQ Health Alliance presented data to parliamentarians on health issues facing LGBTIQ people. Homelessness was recognised as a big factor in poor health because it is hard to be healthy when you are homeless. Almost a quarter of LGBTIQ people had experienced homelessness in their lifetimes. 11.5 per cent had experienced homelessness in the last year, and trans men and trans women were most likely to have reported experiencing homelessness, with almost one in five trans people experiencing some form of homelessness in the last year. And with discrimination and violence bring, being much more likely against trans and non-binary people, homelessness brings even greater risks for them than for other people on the streets. The government has sat on its hands for far too long. They refuse to act to change the policies that make their mates and themselves richer. We must do more. The government should stop sitting on their hands and take urgent action, or much more likely the community should turf them out. Thank you, Senator Rice. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator